This is 7 National News and in our top story, the UAE Vice President, Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum has commend, commended the sporting achievements of the UAE's National Paralympic team at the 2016 Rio Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, where the team collected seven gold, silver and bronze medals. While meeting the members of the team at Zabil Palace on Tuesday afternoon, the ruler of Dubai stated that the will conquers the impossible and no success is without resolve and determination. His Highness also congratulated the champions on their efforts and praised the UAE Disabled Sports Federation, its coaches, managers and all those who contributed to the training and preparation of the team that honored the UAE at the Paralympic Games. The UAE Vice President also announced that the team members will receive financial rewards to motivate and encourage them to score more victories in the future at regional and international competitions. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall as are set to visit the UAE as part of the three-nation tour of the Middle East in November. Prince Charles and wife Camilla will visit the Emirates as well as Oman and Bahrain to strengthen the United Kingdom's warm bilateral relations with key partners in the region, according to local reports. The specific dates and itinerary for the royal couple have, not, have yet to be announced. The Prince of Wales, who is the eldest child and heir apparent of Queen Elizabeth II, is no stranger to the Emirates, having visited the UAE each spring for the past three years on official duties. On his last visit in February 2015, Prince Charles was welcomed by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and the Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces. The Prince has visited the UAE four times in the past decade. The Emirates Red Crescent has announced that the cost of its humanitarian programs, operations and development projects implemented locally and abroad during the first half of the year reached over 285.9 million dirhams. The ERC spent more than 81.7 million dirhams for projects in the country, with about 30,000 families benefiting from the assistance. Meanwhile, abroad it spent about 204.3 million dirhams. According to a report released by the Emirates news agency WAM, the figures were revealed during a media briefing at the ERC headquarters in the presence of a number of officials and representatives of the media. It included information about the authorities' programs and achievements in the first half of 2016 in Yemen as well as refugees in other regions. The fourth edition of the Global Innovation Summit, the biggest congregation of innovation in the region, as well as the Disruptive Innovator Awards 2016, were held at Atlantis de Palm earlier today. His Excellency Abdel Basit Al Janahi, the CEO of Dubai SME, the agency of the Department of Economic Development in Dubai mandated to develop the small and medium enterprise SME sector, inaugurated the summit and also presented the awards, which are meant to acknowledge technology game changers and visionaries who strive to disrupt the regular for a better, smarter, and happier future. The theme for the summit this year is happiness and the smart future. The conference was attended by 2,000 high-profile delegates from different business verticals, including those in the area of smart city, artificial intelligence, internal of the Internet of Things, mobile innovation, 3D printing, wearable tech, smart governance, augmented reality, and more. The fourth summit continued the tradition of growth in size and participation, as in the previous three years' editions of the event. It has so far attracted 8,000 international delegates from Asia, Europe and the Middle East in its three years. The convention was seen as a powerful blend of globally renowned speakers and influential innovators, establishing itself as a trendsetter in the field of disruption and innovation. Governments, um, scholars, universities uh, talk about innovation, um, come up with policies, initiatives. We need to drill that drive to, to the sector. 95% of the, of, the, uh, of the sector uh, of the economy is small and medium enterprises, not businesses. 
their family businesses, their small businesses, their medium-sized businesses. Such summits really brings those ideas, concepts, initiatives, policies, and bridges the gap between the government and the private sector. The private sector should evolve and foresee what the government is trying to do. And the government should listen to what the private sector needs to, to say. I think such platform and such summit brings and bridges the gaps, really. We were looking at both challenges and opportunities, and in terms of opportunities, the ones that really um, seem to resonate best locally are things around how can we really help to reinvent education? It's something which still is probably based on a system from 200 years ago, so how can we make that more fit for the 21st century and reinvent the role of the teacher? Um, we talked a little bit about data marketplaces. If people are going to trade data, how are we going to understand what it's worth, who's going to buy it, when, and it's, although people are thinking very much that this is a concept for the future, trying to understand how data marketplaces really work is, is, is a big issue. So for the advice that I'd give people f to looking for big opportunities would be threefold. I'd say look global, not just local. Look at things that matter in many parts of the world, not just for a local marketplace. Look out more than just today, look out maybe two, three, five years into the future because if you start to look over the horizon you'll see big things coming. And then when you're doing that, look at what you can do uniquely. What is it that's special that you can bring to the party that other people don't have? Don't replicate what other people have done. Move the dial and start to innovate in a completely um, more proactive way. The UAE has retained its position at the top of the world's listing for countries with the most number of English language international schools at 589 compared to only 511 last year. The data was released by the International Schools Consultancy, ISC, which is a leading global market intelligence and research firm focusing on international English-speaking schools. The primary statistics are part of a report that will be presented in full at the International Private Schools Education Forum on the 27th of September in Dubai. At the resumption of the new academic year, the ISC report showed that the total number of kindergarten to 12 English medium international schools worldwide was 8,489, with about 1,504 located in the Middle East, making it the largest sub-region for international schools in the world. Following the UAE, the other countries which figured in the top 10 include China, Pakistan, India and Spain. Saudi Arabia and Japan were in 6th and 7th place, followed by Egypt, Brazil and Indonesia. Going by city, Dubai leads the world for international schools with 276 and Abu Dhabi lies in 3rd place this year with 154 schools. Overall, the ISC has calculated that more than 4.3 million students are now being educated at international schools worldwide, and by 2026, enrollment is projected to reach 8.7 million. The Abu Dhabi City Municipality has recently launched an awareness campaign to strictly implement laws on residential units, stop bachelors from residing in residential districts in Abu Dhabi, and enforce health, safety, and environment standards for all residents. The campaign under the law governing occupancy of residential neighborhoods in Abu Dhabi Emirate aims to stop crowded accommodations by evicting company workers and bachelors from residential districts and enforcing health, public health and hygiene standards. The municipality has urged all community members to adopt proper health practices and follow the rules on occupancy of residential units. According to local reports, an inspection team distributed the guidelines and laws governing occupancy of residential units on Abu Dhabi Island to landlords and security guards. The law stipulates that bachelors, up to six people, can be accommodated in detached residential villas. The occupants must be employees of local and federal government, private institutions and judiciary or diplomats. Villas and residential units can be rented out for hotel and tourism purposes if licensed by Abu Dhabi Tourism and Culture Authority. According to municipality officials, overcrowding puts pressure on parking spaces sewerage and water and electricity networks. It also breaches the privacy of community members and violators that rules of security, safety, environment, public health, tranquility and general appearance. 
The campaign is also targeting absconding workers occupying residential units in coordination with the Ministry of Labor and Abu Dhabi Police. And finally in the bulletin, while cricket fans in the UAE are looking forward to the T20 Cricket Festival that begins this weekend with the Pakistan and West Indies series, the UAE national team got a chance to showcase their talent against the current world champions during a warm-up game. UAE national took on the hard-hitting West Indies side on Tuesday evening where they put on a strong fight against the reigning T20 champions. However, the target of 166 proved to be too much to chase in the end as the game ended with as a 22-run defeat. Played under the lights at the ICC Academy, the UAE did well with the ball to take seven wickets in the first innings with the UAE bowlers Ahmed Raza and Mohamed Navid improving their chances to earn a spot in the Pakistani Super League. During their run chase, the UAE side looked well poised to securing a major win in their history. However, a batting collapse meant an uphill task in the end. For the UAE players' exhibition games against the top touring sides provides an ideal experience for their season ahead, while for many it is a chance to shine against their icons. Earlier this year, the UAE offered central contracts to around 12 players, upgrading them from part-time cricket players to full-time professional players, with according, which according to the skipper Amjad Javed, has been instrumental in improving their game. For the Caribbean side, the game provided a chance to get used to the UAE conditions. When you're playing with the world champions, yeah, definitely you have to be more experienced like uh, like them. And uh, our batsmen really did a little bit little mistakes in uh, when they're playing against uh, Narayan and Badri. So that was a crucial time when uh, Narayan came back and he took two wickets in one over. So that was a turning turning point for us. If you see our past performance in T20s, yeah, we are really uh, doing well in uh, in these two departments, bowling and fielding. Yeah, the point is, uh, the problem is in the batting. Like uh, when you are getting some partnership, we are not continuing to build that partnership and uh, finish the game. So today was also the same uh, issue. Uh, we have started well, and uh, in the middle also we have really in ten overs we we scored 80 runs and uh, just one wicket down, and then uh, we collapsed at one stage when Shaiman and uh, we lost uh, uh, Ramiz uh, both in one over. We were looking for a winner and that we got. Um, we don't want to start the tour um, on a losing note. Um, I thought uh, we played um, decent enough and we're just going to look to you know, step it up when, when the tournament starts. Chasing down the total, getting very close, was a, a very good batting performance by the UAE. And um, I, I just thought they, they played all-round cricket. They, bought, they played very um, good all-round cricket. Um, they were good in the field, good with the bat. Um, just must say um, congratulations to them.